okay. <laughs> All right. So hello, everyone. I am Jordan Randall. So alongside with the Political Science Club, which I'm the co-leader of and also the treasurer, me and Chloe Youngblood and Emily Saunders have planned an event for the student panel for today. And we will be having Autumn Millsally Hack and Jacqueline Reich. And for the first speaker, we will be having Jacqueline Reich speak, but I should probably also introduce myself. I am Jordan, Re wait, did I introduce I myself? I did, oh wow, a little, a little com comedy. All right, first up is Jacqueline Reich. Well, hi everybody, and I'm so glad that you're here because I had a chance to uh, look at Autumn's uh, work and I think you're in for a real treat. I wanted though to help her out a little bit. I didn't want to like put any extra work on her. And I thought, geez, you know, people are gonna be walking in and not really know about this region uh, called the Balkans, which kind of has an infamous history in international relations, which is my area. And so uh, she's going to be diving right into some of the uh, dynamics of the region and why uh, organized crime has gotten such a tenacious hold there. And so I thought we would start with just knowing a little bit about the region and then I'll turn it over to her. And. Uh, so anybody who's had a class with me knows I am huge on maps, okay? And I am just going to show you many maps. So let's see, does this clicker have a point? Ah, excellent, okay, great. So I just figured I would start really basic. So here is the United States. And then uh, the Balkans are on the other side of the world. And everybody can see Italy right there, yes? Okay, so uh, the Balkans are right across the Adriatic in this area, okay, is where the Balkans is. And so you can get, there we go. Uh, so we're now gonna tell us, uh, or microscope in, I guess. So here, here's Italy again, to orient yourselves. And we're looking, you know, right at this area, okay? as known as the Balkans. And then you can see it's primarily uh, this area below Austria and Hungary. Some scholars call Romania and Bulgaria as part of the Balkans. I can see why that's the case. But you're gonna see historically, this area has had a, 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 an opportunity to operate as a single political unit. So that's really often when people say the Balkans, we're really thinking about this area here. So here's Greece, here's Italy, Austria, you've probably heard of, Hungary, okay. But you may not have heard of these countries and that's really the area collectively known as the Balkans. Okay, I'm always interested in what is causing the borders to happen and uh, two maps, can tell you that it's really not one, but the other. So the first map is a uh, topographical map. And what's, what was interesting to me is you have these mountains all along here, but I mean, the country that sticks out with the weird shape is Croatia. And it's kind of like, geez, it's not like, I expected like the mountains to kind of end here, but they don't, they, they continue up into Slovenia and, and then this plane is kind of shared. So what's, what's driving this? It didn't really look like the geography was especially driving these borders, but oh, let's look at the ethnic composition and right away you can see, okay, yes, yes. Turns out, so ethnicity is based on some combination of language, religion, uh, culture, okay? Uh, those, those things usually make it up and uh, peoples will share a common heritage based on uh, those kinds of traits. And so, yeah, we can see now, we can see why there's that Croatia country that's so different from 
Serbia, which is also ethnically distinct. We've got a big group of uh, people of Albanian heritage and Kos Kosovars, Kosovo, is uh, ethnically Albanian, okay? We've got North Macedonia. We've got this purple area called Montenegro. So all of the borders are kind of more or less conforming. And then we have this area called Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is like a quilt, right, of all the different ethnicities messed in there. Okay, so, so these ethnicities, as it turns out, there, there are religious distinctions, there are linguistic or language distinctions, uh, and historical distinctions that uh, help make these peoples feel like they're so different from each other. Okay, so for that, we need a little history. Uh, I really wanted to talk about uh, how we've got different religions in the area. So uh, we have the two uh, Christian branches, the two largest, I guess, most fundamental Christian divisions, Western Christianity, Western European Christianity, and uh, before the 1500s, it was the Roman Catholic Church. And then we have the Orthodox Christians, and they're in two big groups, okay? Uh, you can see the Southern branch, which would be Greek Orthodox, and then uh, spreading up into Russia, but then you can see there's this uh, Orthodox group. Spreading up through here is the Ottoman Empire, and the Ottomans are uh, based in Turkey, and the big religion is going to be Muslim. Okay, so what we have here is yellow is primarily Muslim, but see the stripes tells you that there's a mix of Muslims living with Orthodox Christians all, all through this region. And uh, you can see the green would be Roman Catholic. Okay, so those three are coming together in uh, what could be maybe, I mean, everybody's religious, they should all be living according to the good book, right? Uh, or maybe not, maybe there are gonna be uh, lots of distinctions, but okay. So I wanted to point that out to you. So this map happened to be from 1555, okay? Skip ahead and you can see that uh, we've got some consolidation here, so the Ottoman Empire has gone all the way up into, yeah, present-day Bosnia. The Croatians are hanging in there. Um, and uh, the Hungarians, it's all part of the Austrian Empire. So we've got a story of empires. But empires are not like countries. Empires usually have a core people who are first among equals, right? The citizens plus, I'll use the lingo from another class of mine. And then you have, well, conquered peoples. And if they are considered citizens at all, they would be citizens minus. But conquered peoples may not have any rights at all. Okay, well, these are not the core of either of these empires. They're conquered areas. Okay. All right, uh, leading up to World War I. Okay, I'm uh, showing you here that the Ottoman Empire is a, a, a shadow of itself. It's going to disappear after World War I. And the Austro-Hungarian Empire is going to go away after World War I. All right. Uh, and so, after World War I, we have a new country created. And it's called Yugoslavia, which means Southern Slav. And uh, so all of those... Balkan countries are all uh, swallowed up there in part of this uh, country. And it's, uh, we've got Albania sticking out by itself, but otherwise they're all together. And then after World War II, the country with a few, very few up primarily up here, uh, border changes, it continues as this Yugoslavia, but now, you have it as uh, being part of the communist bloc. And so uh, you have a repression of those religious ideas and uh, Albania is communist as well. And in fact, uh, the religious identity almost completely goes away. Uh, this is one of the most 
uh, atheistic countries in the world during that time. Okay. So all of these boundaries are seemingly subsumed. Whoops, sorry. But then in the end of the Cold War, and Autumn's gonna talk a lot about the breakup of Yugoslavia. And you can see it happens within the space of a few years with uh, Slovenia and Croatia breaking away first. Those were the Roman Catholic uh, inspired groups, right? And then Bosnia, which is that mix of uh, 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 Orthodox uh, Serbs, there are some Serbs there, and the Bosniaks are Muslim. Uh, there is a war that is declared where uh, Bo uh, Bosnian Serbs basically declare war and want to separate and join greater Serbia or Serbia here. Serbia decides it's going to support Bosnia or those Serbs and Croatia decides it will support the Bosnians. Okay, vicious, vicious war, terrible war crimes, genocide, mass rape, uh, children slaughtered, uh, whole towns wiped out. Really, really terrible. That's not the end. Uh, you have Montenegro, which decides that it would like to be independent. And Kosovo decides it wants to be independent. None of these are peaceful uh, transitions. So you've got a period of terrible, terrible uh, wars that happen. And uh, Autumn will speak directly about what happened. So I, I just did a little in-depth look at the Bosnian war, but, whoops, okay. Yeah, there we go. Oh, I know, I got somehow this. Oh, oh messing up my PowerPoint. <laughs> All right, well, anyway, this is a map that maybe Autumn would like to refer to at various points. I made it available. This is uh, where we are today. So uh, take it away. Um, I guess I'll introduce myself. It or Jordan already did. But I'm Autumn Zaliak. I'm a senior. Uh, my major is criminal justice and my minor is in European studies. And my project I'm presenting to everybody today is organized crime, corruption, and response in the Western Balkans. Um, and thank you, Dr. Reich, for your map. That was, it was a great idea. And I, I could listen to you talk all day. So <laughs> thank you for... I'm very loud. <laughs> I might not need it. <laughs> okay, so yeah, let's just hop into it. So as Dr. Reich was expressing earlier, um, Yugoslavia experienced a series of wars and conflicts, and it, as a result of this, because of all the violence, the UN had placed sanctions on the region. Sanctions are a great idea until obviously the civilians have great issues, one of them being they could not get any supplies into the region. So by supplies, I mean everything from food, water, medical supplies, uh, weapons, you name it, they could not get it into the country. And so this is a great idea for organized crime groups to start up in which they did, and they found a way to get all of these basic supplies into the country from exterior countries, or just illegally mass producing these goods within the country. Obviously, when you have this going on for years, like this did, it sort of develops this weird culture of getting things the way that you're not supposed to get them. And so when we exit the Yugoslav Wars and transition into a more Western democracy, this culture stayed. So then we were left with something called the Western Balkans, and therefore the Balkan route. So the, the Balkan route is like this weird geopolitical, his, historical, sociological term that we use to describe the routes used for trafficking and smuggling. As you can see, it's predominantly from the Middle East and Caucasus region through the Western Balkans and, and out towards Western Europe. If you walk away from anything learning about the Balkan route today, it's that this is very ambiguous. These are the roots that we know, the tried and trues, if you will. These are the roots that traffickers can use knowing that they can get through border patrol because they'll turn their cheek the other way. These are the roots that we know that are politically interfered with. So these are the roots that we know are taken for sure. This is ambiguous because they're 
are countless routes that we do not know about and they are constantly changing. One of the current events that you're probably aware of is the war in Ukraine. That's completely changed the routes. The routes are completely different now. And we haven't yet figured out where they are, where they're going, how goods are getting into the country, because just like Yugoslavia exper experiencing a war, Ukraine is experiencing a war, and so they also need a way to get goods into the country. So the war in Ukraine has altered the routes drastically and has created new ones, new transit zones. This situation in Afghanistan also changed the routes because the Balkan route is not used just to go from Middle East to Western Europe. It is also Western Europe to Middle East. So when everything started happening with the Taliban in Afghanistan, the need for goods to get into that region was also needed. And so it changed the routes again. So this is really ambiguous and ever changing. And it's constantly a concern because you, you find a route that's really used and you know all about it and then <laughs> something happens somewhere else in the world and you need to change it all over again. So if you walk away with anything today, just know that this is tried and true, but there are many others that we need to know more about and figure out how to prevent more of them from occurring. So organized crime today, I'm not gonna break down a bunch of numbers because nobody wants to hear a bunch of numbers, but the numbers that you do need to know. Uh, organized crime today uh, is composed of drug trafficking and production, which equates for 51%, smuggling of migrants at 36%, human trafficking at 10, and firearms trafficking at three. Three seems like a really small number, but it's very important nonetheless, which I'll get to in a second. But this is the main uh, composition that we need to worry about. And so I have some interesting yet concerning points about human trafficking, drug production, all of that. But what I wanted to say about the firearms is even though it equates for only 3% of the issue in the region, the Western Balkans is very small and they have a lot of guns in the country. They don't experience gun violence issues like we do in the United States just because the culture is very different. But oftentimes the guns produced out of Yugoslavia and the amount per capita is oftentimes compared to the United States. It is a very, very dense population of guns per capita or per village, if you want to say that. There are 4.9 million firearms estimated to be in civilian possession in 2017. They don't yet have the numbers for 2022, but obviously we're assuming these numbers have gone up. The reason why there's so many today still being produced is because they have really high-end, if you will, buyers. So the Sicilian Mafia is a huge buyer of firearms out of the Balkans, as is the Middle East and ISIS. One of the weird things that I always found about this specifically is that they're still producing at the rate that they are today because when Yugoslavia experienced the wars, there were so many fire. There was like 4 million estimated firearms to be produced during that time. A lot of them ended up in the United States actually. So if you for some reason ever come across an M40 or an AK-47, it will probably say made in Yugoslavia. <laughs> so just to show you how many firearms came out of a couple year span in itself, and then today that they're still mass producing, it says a lot about these firearms and they're getting to countries across an ocean. So that is of concern. The trafficking is also of a concern. Recently, because of the war in Syria, that like increased trafficking uh, immensely. 400,000 women are being trafficked through the various Balkan routes and into Europe, and 170,000 women are trafficked into the Balkans alone. So that means that 400,000 are going through it and ending up somewhere else, and 170,000 women are trafficked in the Balkans and they're there to stay or they're going from one Balkan country to a different Balkan country. Montenegro, I put on here just because it's my weird fascination. <laughs> so uh, Montenegro during Yugoslavia was known for its cigarette production and cigarettes are like, oh, it's just cigarettes, you know, like what's that gonna do? Well, they're known as the cigarette empire of the world. They produce faux cigarettes and they also make, you know, legally produced cigarettes 
by the millions. And this is a huge issue for the European economy because cigarettes make a lot of money, especially nowadays because we've increased the price. Cigarettes are very embodied in European culture. Like they're, they're very important everywhere in Europe. And if you're producing millions of euros worth of fake cigarettes, that's obviously going to greatly impact your economy. So yeah, as I expressed here, it boosted the economy immensely during Yugoslavia and the culture of producing these cigarettes had stayed. Millions of euros were lost from cigarette revenue. And we'll get to this in a tiny bit, but from one prime minister alone, 100,000 cases of cigarettes were smuggled in monthly over an eight year period, which equated to about 100 billion cases of cigarettes. We'll get to the prime minister in a second because he's also responsible for something else, but I didn't want to spoil it. And finally, the last fun fact, if you will, is the issue with banana packages. Check your banana packages because Montenegro has a banana package problem. Bananas aren't the problem, it's the cocaine that's found in the bananas. Um, so it's like a weird, I don't know how unique that is to the Americas, but uh, there's a city called Bar Montenegro that every couple of months they'll find like thousands of pounds of cocaine in their banana shipments. So that's also been a, very concerning point that I wanted to put on here as well. And also, I don't want to say funny, but interesting nonetheless. So of course the war in Ukraine, like I said, greatly impacts the Balkans, but maybe not in the way that we expect. Yeah, we have the Balkan route, we need to worry about trafficking patterns being altered because of wars, but um, I'll just start at the top here. So we have the, the, the war in Ukraine has the potential to manifest more organized crime in the Western Balkans, specifically crimes related to firearms because the war is going on, money laundering and altering the, tra the trafficking routes as I expressed earlier. We also have an issue with Rus Russian citizens immigrating out of the nation due to their sanctions in Russia. So there is a concern that Russian money and people may find connections established uh, in criminal groups in the Balkans, which is actually already an issue before the war occurred. A lot of Russian questionable businessmen had organized crime ties to uh, Yugoslavia just because they always had really great relations and that stayed after the wars. And so a lot of old Russian money is making its way into the Western Balkans because they already have quote unquote business there. There's also a potential increase of trafficking of women and children. We have so many refugees exiting Ukraine right now. Obviously, the Western Balkans is very geographically convenient, and so we need to worry about the women and children that are going into this region that already has a high issue with trafficking. And if you're a refugee, you're obviously a vulnerable group. Another vulnerable group is youth in Oregon. I need a coffee break. <laughs> Youth in organized crime. So, youth are obviously a really big proponent of getting into trouble. <laughs> but uh, youth in the Balkans particularly are extra susceptible to organized crime, not just because it's an organized crime heavy region, but simply because of the economic need and the culture of it. So a lot of the youth that are in the Balkans obviously want to pursue university just like we did. And universities in the Balkans are great by every means. It's just a lot of Balkan youth want to get out of you know, their home country and their home region and go somewhere else. The thing is when you go to a university somewhere else, you're more inclined to stay and you don't move back to your home country. However, the Balkans is a generally economically poor region. And so a lot of youth cannot afford that move and they cannot afford to attend the more expensive universities in Western and Central Europe. So when you have the economic need, you're more likely to involve yourself in quick money, AKA organized crime. And there's also been an issue with the luxurious Serbian mafia lifestyle that's really attracted the youth. And so having these luxurious goods, plus being able to provide for their families that desperately need it, organized crime is the answer. And it's very difficult for youth to exit organized crime groups because when you're making quick money constantly from drug trafficking, it's really difficult to get out of it because you know when your next paycheck is going to be, it's a reliable source of income, it is a job. And so it's very difficult to get the youth 
out of organized crime groups once they get in. Can we raise it slightly? Or no? It's fine. You guys can read the law. <laughs> Maybe. It might just be a little too zoomed in. That's fine. There we go. OK, thank you. <laughs> so obviously, half of this presentation is also about corruption in the region. There are a lot of examples of corruption that I wanted to share, but I didn't want to be on this slide for an eternity. So we're just going over some concepts of Serbia and Bosnia, um, because that was my predominant focus as well in my research. And so we'll start at the top here. Bribery, legality, and corruption is not present in the criminal code. What does that mean? This is Serbia, by the way. The Serbian flag is the red, blue, yellow, and then the Bosnian flag is the yellow and blue with the stars. So bribery is technically legal in Serbia, and what that means is the tiny little section up at the top right corner, currently it is not possible to prosecute individuals for bribery. For example, a person who bribes a member of parliament to vote for a particular proposal. There is technically no law saying that you cannot do it, and therefore it's technically not illegal. Corruption is also not present in the criminal code. In the United States, we have corruption clearly stated in our criminal code. In Serbia, it's not even in there. If it's not in there, it's technically not illegal. Public prosecutors are also not obligated to investigate all documented claims of corruption, such as those exposed by the media or NGOs. That means that if you, as an ordinary citizen or a member of an NGO or some media source, have a really solid case of somebody in head of state or a political figure or really anybody, if you have a really solid case saying that they are a corrupt individual and you bring it to a prosecutor, they do not need to look at your case. They don't need you to tell them about it. They don't need to look into it. They can just politely or not politely <laughs> tell you to leave. You, they aren't required to look at it and they won't get in trouble for that. There's also a wide range of corrupt state activities as I'm sure you can presume, such as political interference, clientelism, abuse of public office and bribery which leads us to tailor-made laws. These holes are here for a reason. These holes are here so that these crimes can be committed because they're technically not crimes. And finally, I don't want to say my favorite, but my most interesting point, I think, down here, Prime Minister Fidel Novalic, who is the prime minister that smuggled all those cigarettes I was talking about earlier, was accused of misusing approximately 6 million euros, and he is currently attending the court hearings, facing corruption and embezzlement charges, while at the same time maintaining his head of prime minister duties. <laughs> How this is allowed? Well, it's technically not illegal. <laughs> so when <laughs> we have a prime minister smuggling hundreds of millions of euros worth of cigarettes, he is still allowed to actively do his prime minister duties. Obviously, that's an issue. OK, so what are the challenges? Obviously, there seems like a lot, right? Well, for one, we have an issue with citizen morale in the country. When, when you can't prosecute people that need prosecuting, it does something to the community. If it makes it seem like it's a helpless situation, and it is what it is. So there's low citizen interaction with polls and anti-corruption groups and activism in general because it just seems like everything is at a loss, and there's not really too much that you can do about it. We also have the issue with youth involvement, many Balkan youth leaving the region for better opportunities, and the ones that do stay are tempted by the quick money of organized crime. We also have an issue with media capture. When a journalist wants to say something about a politician here, they usually don't need to worry about disappearing or their family disappearing. In this region, not so much. It's rare that journalists are executed, but it's not entirely uncommon. So obviously that's an issue. We need protection for our media to be able to be outspoken about these corrupt political figures. There's also, of course, because of that, government intervention with the media as, as much as you can imagine. We also have a lack of experts both in the region and outside of the region. We simply don't have enough people that know how organized crime operates in the region and how to measure it appropriately. And when we do have people that are doing awesome work in NGOs in the region, there's not really any interregional collaboration. So if you are doing really awesome work in an NGO in Albania, and if you're doing really awesome work in Bosnia, 
they're not sharing information. They're not saying, hey, this is working over here. Like, come check this out, share resources. That's not happening, and that needs to happen. Because although you should start locally with your corruption and organized crime issues, a lot of that goes so much further beyond your local town. And so it needs to be a very interconnected, interregional uh, force tackling this issue. And finally, what needs our focus? Well, everything that I just said in the slide before. So we need more intelligence-led policing. To get more intelligence-led policing, we need more analysis on organized crime and corruption. We need more people that know something about this and can study it intensively to be able to give proper information, proper statistics to police so that they can effectively do their jobs and effectively use their resources. We need more programs for youth to keep them off the streets and more engaged in their communities not with organized crime. We also need to resolve media capture. Journalists need to be able to express their research. They need to be able to talk about what's happening in the country without literally fearing for their lives. And lastly, and I think most importantly, we need more interregional collaboration. Stuff like this isn't really big in the United States. We don't have too many scholars that know about what's happening in the Balkans in the United States. Same thing with Asia and even Western Europe. We need more interregional collaboration to tackle this issue because even though it is just in the Western Balkan countries in this tiny little region and like one corner of Europe, it affects the entire world. And so I think with these five major components, I think we can actually stagger the issue. That's all, thank you. I did play out with you. <laughs> Any questions, comments, discussion? Katerina? Yes, very much so. Uh, in fact, both of those governments are extremely friendly with each other. So resources and money between those countries is very, very strong. And so, I mean, I would say Belarus is a major proponent and um, a sister, if you will, um, for the issue in corruption and organized crime, because a lot of the stuff that's trafficked through the Balkans goes through Belarus, and Belarus knows what's going on. They know where it's coming from. So, yes. Would you say that um, Belarusians, like the citizens, have less of a, it, it is what it is mentality, or do you think that they have more of a mentality? That is a hot question, Katerina. <laughs> okay. I think the Belarusian citizens are a little less at a loss than the Balkan nations, I would say, by like a sliver. They've had a lot more, you know, citizen upheaval. Mm -hmm. This region hasn't had citizen upheaval. It's very small. It's very online based. You don't have people on the streets throwing bathtubs through prime minister's windows, <laughs> so, which I don't know, maybe we need more of that. Um, but yeah, so I would say, that maybe the situation is worse here with the citizen morale in comparison, but you know, of course, only with some things, because Belarus has also very unique issues for the region. So, yeah, no, no, that's a good question. Now that makes me want to look into that. <laughs> yes, Dr. Vera. How brutal? Do I have a typo? <laughs> I don't think resolve might be important. So I think it's resolve. Somebody look that up. <laughs> Isn't it? I don't think so, but I also That's fair. Regional slash international because you're really extending Yeah. Not just to the region. Oh, right. Resolve is the word in resolution. Resolution. Yeah. You're right. You're right. Uh, okay. It's resolution. So I, I would actually. <laughs> so I have a couple of points that are not, they're going to I asked for questions, Dr. So I wonder, you know, mm -hmm. just in thinking out loud, I mean, there's even you know, the business of war, mm -hmm. right? So when we talk about these transient groups and the fact that they're being manipulated and used and changed accordingly, someone needs to know something about those groups. Mm -hmm. Um, it just, it's interesting to me, and I mean, maybe this is just because I, I haven't attended in, in studies of terrorism, um, 
that in terms of collecting open access information, they're able to use social media traffic mm -hmm. to find out who the people in charge are. It would be really interesting to know if perhaps the shifting and changing of these groups, you know, if someone is, in, is engaging in the business of the war. Like, right. Because, because you're talking about a lot of wars in a small region in a concentrated period of time. Is someone basically marketing themselves as the how to bypass the borders or bypass the enforcement or bypass the enforcement of bypass. It's another it's presentation. Not <laughs> the right. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, in terms of your roots, you don't identify money. And what goes out is money is somehow tackled up in the which makes my first point even more. Because you need to know how to bypass the people who do know about Right. Mm -hmm. And so those groups are going to be constantly fluid. You might not mm -hmm. want to traffic in money, but if you know, I mean, um, God, if you know money's coming the opposite way, mm -hmm. that's a lot less. That's a lot more traffic. Right. Yeah. Now, yeah. Um, so I've traveled money where roots, I think I got it. Okay. Roots were people, and in terms of the business of the war, mm -hmm. and then it became the people who are using the social media. And the comment I had about it not being in the criminal code, I get all that. I think it's a wonderful observation. I wonder if they justify that because it's in some kind of ethical expectation. Mm, that's true. And in times of war, ethics become kind of a convoluted. Yeah. <laughs> they're just, it's almost like mm. techniques of neutralization. Right. right? Mm -hmm. We're not going to codify this because we can't provide a rigid structure under which somebody has to live because living at this point becomes food and, right. and, and necessity based. Um, and the final comment I'll make is that where you are and what you've described here is not unlike periods of American jurisprudence. Mm -hmm. It almost feels like this or the region is in the process. We've been there. This is a Familiar play playbook for us, mm -hmm. but it's not good. right. So it, it's interesting to see or to watch and see where this ends up because I there are very um, stark similarities. I think we can pinpoint in America. I would defer to my political science colleague on that, but I don't think where they are is unlike the places we've been in our own development. Um, you're talking to the wrong political <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I know that was a lot. No, but yeah. Later, if mm -hmm. you're looking at this to for graduate purposes, mm -hmm. I would like to see the, uh, the focus of more away from the organization of crime to the individual. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think there are tools out there now mm -hmm. where you can potentially identify you know, the players in this. Right. Mm -hmm. And I will just say to you, as I've said to you in the past, you have to start my I need to start what? My Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> I watched the <laughs> Does anybody have anything else? Yeah, Jordan. So the bribery that's like, of, has occurred throughout the, like, the country, um, for it being like so small and and as like Professor Rivera said um, about so many wars happening mm -hmm. in such a small country, um, like, do you see any like possibility that for it happening, if there is like more than one um, individual um, or even like an organization or such, um, do you think they could be doing that to just like? Cause a distraction for whatever the rules are for that country in itself, being that bribery is technically legal. Wait, elaborate slightly more. <laughs> so, like, because they might have a role in causing wars and everything, do you think there are political like, figures? Yeah, so, mm -hmm. like, do you think that there's any alternative motives to? Money. 
Yeah. Money. It's always money. I mean, prime ministers make a lot of money as is, even in countries like this. But the other issue is a lot of political figures and heads of state were organized crime leads in Yugoslavia. So you literally had mob bosses climbing to the top. They just changed out their gun for a suit and gained a political position. A lot of them have been known to be in the mafia back in Yugoslavia. And they just followed where the money was going. They had an opportunity and they took it. And so I think what's the best excuse other than making a couple extra bucks? Like that prime minister was making millions of euros off of the smuggled cigarettes. And so it's the same thing with bribery. If it's going to get you millions of euros, why wouldn't you stay in that business? If that answers it. <laughs> <laughs> it does. I guess uh, another quick question about it. Um, being that if there was like outside influence from other mm -hmm. countries, oh yeah, um, which is you know most likely, um, do you foresee it ever coming to more of a close at one point or another? It's really hard to see. I this know. has been an issue since the '90s. We're going on like 25 years now of this, and it's getting bigger and growing and growing and growing. That's the thing. Like, there was maybe a dip in like 2005, 2006 of general corruption and organized crime activity, aka basically when there was a conversation about joining the EU, but they never joined the EU <laughs> for starters. And secondly, it's just been rising since then. Honestly, I think. From my research, what I've noticed in some of these countries, organized crime and corruption is worse than it was than the two years preceding, uh, like post Yugoslav wars. So do I see it ending? I mean, like organized crime never ends, corruption never ends. It's just like, can you get it down to an acceptable point? And I think it's going to take another 10 years for us to actually see any kind of De like significant decreases. So unfortunately, no, not anytime soon. But if we get, if we get some, you know, m uh, momentum on these, <laughs> maybe sooner before that. But like, this is like, you're, you're asking, can you change a culture at the end of the day? This is very embedded in the culture. Not to say that these cultures are surrounded with organized crime. It's just, you have to think, we have three generations now that have been impacted by Yugoslavia and have been involved in organized crime. It is now a generational curse to break in a way. So it's getting generations that didn't experience organized crime, which is gonna take two more generations. <laughs> Katarina, your face. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? If that answers that. No? I just have one observation. I, I do think you know I can talk about uh, you know my experiences when I travel with Joseph mm -hmm. and I. But I, I also think that one of the greatest disruptors of organized crime and that method of doing business is when it, the economy becomes stronger and independent of the organized mm -hmm. economy. You introduced the foothold being the need to find an alternative way to get mm -hmm. goods into the country. When an economy is stronger has a healthy import export, people are making money, and they can choose to do yes. more traditional legal routes. You're going to naturally disempower right. the, the organized crime element of that. Um, and I think in everything that I read and heard afterwards, Prague would be an example of a, of a city that, that really embraced its tourism industry. Mm -hmm. It was it was divesting itself, although there was a heavy presence certainly there, but divesting themselves of, as being identified as a hotbed of organized crime. And from everything that I, I witnessed, from everything that I researched, it was successfully mm -hmm. emerging until COVID. Right. <laughs> and that really just collapsed because it was, mm -hmm. I've had this conversation, a tentative and tenuous yes. revert. Mm -hmm. COVID has shifted the power back to getting goods in an alternative way. Right. So, you know, to your point, Jordan, I think that the more healthy an economy becomes independent of criminal pathways, the more likely you are to have 
at least the promise of the elimination of a reduction. Mm -hmm. Right. Of Absolutely. Yeah. I, um, I'm not that knowledgeable about the area. And you didn't seem it in your presentation. <laughs> uh, broad strokes. <laughs> the, um, one of the really fascinating things that I learned in preparing that uh, part was uh, for Albania, it had um, a number of factors that kind of uh, enabled it or, or put it in a position, I guess not enabled it, but put it in a position to become very isolated. Mm -hmm. And I was reading that it was the middle of the 20th century. You still had a very tribal attitude. Yes. Okay. And I was just wondering to what extent is that uh, the case in uh, some of the other neighboring countries? That's a good question. So Albania is definitely unique in that sense. You know, like even their governmental system, like it has not changed much since Yugoslavia in the sense that like if you had some sort of legal related issue to take care of, you didn't go to a regional like district court or anything like that. You went to the oldest man in the village, <laughs> like li literally, you went to the, with, with the most, you know, administration to him. And, you know, those qualifications aren't always that qualified. So their governmental system in Albania is very like tribal in that sense where they don't necessarily have the same governmental and legal roles that we do over here or in Western Europe or honestly the rest of the Balkans because you don't really see that in Serbia or Bosnia or Montenegro, they're very structured, I guess a little bit more Western democratized. So I think Albania is very unique in that sense. Okay. So, yeah. Jordan. <laughs>